Good evening, everyone. Um, today, uh, we have a combined session between the FRCS Mentor Group and Orthopedic Research UK, as uh, usual on uh, uh, Wednesday evenings. We are going to start by the uh, introduction. And uh, uh, we are, today, we have a very interesting session uh, presented by Ms. Jo Dartnell, who is a consultant pediatric orthopedic uh, surgeon in Maidstone and uh, Tunbridge Wells uh, NHS Trust, and Mr. Anish uh, Sangrajka, a consultant pediatric orthopedic uh, surgeon in North Norwich University Hospitals and uh, NHS uh, Trust, which they are going to uh, give you how to play your peds right in the FRCS exam. We thought that uh, coming up with the uh, April uh, exam, this will be very interesting. They are going to show you how to answer uh, the pediatric uh, vivas and how to uh, score in this table. Uh, please uh, uh, feel free to uh, write any uh, questions uh, you have in the uh, chat uh, box and we are going to answer uh, answer them. There is MCQ after uh, this uh, uh, session and there is a Viva practice uh, in which uh, Ms. Dartnell and uh, Mr. Uh, Sangrashka will uh, uh, Viva uh, candidates. Please uh, message uh, Hannah uh, if you want to partake in the Viva practice. At the end, I uh, would like to recommend the concise orthopedic notes, which helped me uh, to prepare for my uh, exam, as well as the basic science uh, books from the ORUK. Uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, stop sharing and uh, please, Ms. Dartnell, if you want to start sharing and uh, start viving each other. Thank you very much. Well Hi everyone, um, thanks Joe for that. So we're gonna do something slightly a little bit different to suspect your other talks. And I'm going to pretend to be the examiner and Anish is gonna be the FRCS candidate. And we thought we would just go through the main core topics that you're bound to get in PEDS um, and hopefully show you the exact things of well, what we would expect you as examiners um, to come up with. So, um, Anish. Yes. So guys, while I'm answering the questions, I want you to think about what you're going to be saying in that same time. Uh, Adnan, we are going to be doing vivas for everyone else after this. So I just see on the chat you put you'd like to participate. You'll get your chance, mate. Um, so yeah, while we're doing this, you need to be thinking about what you're going to be saying. Uh, and what we're going to do is you're going to get five minutes for your vibers. I'm going to try and answer everything in two and a half minutes uh, for, for each thing to show it's possible, hopefully. <laughs> Brilliant. So this is a 14 year old young man. Um, he's had six months of right thigh pain. Um, the last 48 hours has suddenly become a lot worse. Um, and it's, take me through your thought process. What are you thinking when looking at this? What's going on? Uh, so we've got an AP pelvis and a frog lateral radiograph. Uh, and the obvious abnormality here is a slipped femoral epiphysis. Uh, looking at the pictures we have, I'd be worried that this is a severe slip. I'd want to measure the Southwick angle, but it can be very tricky here. You can see on the frog lateral, you're not getting a very good frog at all. So I think it'd be safe to say that the slip angle is going to be over 50 degrees here. Uh, you've told me that things got much worse in the last 24 hours. Did you say that the symptoms were going on for a few weeks before that? Yeah, it's, the whole thing's about six months altogether, but it's 48 hours now that it's much worse. So this sounds like an acute on chronic slip. Uh, where are we seeing him? Did he walk into the hospital? Um, he got wheelchaired in to a &E, um, um, down in a &E at the moment. So what I'd really like to see is if he can stand, even with people holding him up, is he able to stand upright? No, he's in a lot of pain now, he can't. Right, so this is uh, a severe, unstable, acute on chronic slip from an epiphysis. Uh, and it's a controversial area. There are different ways of managing this. Um, personally, I'd be um, looking at the two options of pinning in situ, uh, but my concern would be it'd be a technically very difficult uh, procedure to try and pin that. So the other option would be uh, discussing it with the paediatric orthopaedic surgeons to see whether they think 
uh, some sort of neck shortening intracapsular osteotomy might be a better option at this stage. Uh, the controversies about this would include the timing. Uh, some people would want to rest the patient on traction for a couple of weeks to make the acute slip chronic, uh, whereas others say there's no difference and you can get on with your first available list. Um, and the other kind of controversy would be the approach. Some people, uh, I think in this country, it's very common to use the anterior approach and do something like a cuneiform or a fish osteotomy, uh, but there is a, a big trend moving towards the done osteotomy through a surgical dislocation. Um, would you like to mention anything about his other side? Um, so looking at Klein's line, uh, looking at the physis, I don't see any problems there right now. I would ask him whether there have been any issues. No, he's had no pain on that side. No. And the other things I'd want to discuss, you, sorry, you did say he's, is he 14 years old? 14, yeah. yeah. So in terms of age, I don't think that's a big risk factor for a, a slip on the other side. The reported literature is about 20 to 30 percent for bilateral slips. I would want to know a bit about his past medical history. So does he have any issues with renal failure? Does he have any endo endocrinopathies? Okay, no, no, he's not. Um, he's a large lad um, and... No, no other medical problems at all. And do the family okay, um, like they'd be compliant? Um, they're from uh, quite a low socioeconomic group. Um, they have DNA appointments about his weight and dietitian in the past. Right. Um, so right. a bit touch and go, probably. OK. Um, so, yeah, that's something we'd have to take into consideration with counselling for the family. Yeah. Would you consider prophylactic pinning of the other side, do you think? Uh, definitely, based on what you've said. Yeah. Do you know any evidence around? Well, um, so there's, again, um, some people have argued that the numbers needed to treat is quite high. Uh, so you'd be pinning a lot of hips just to save a few. Uh, there was a paper, I believe, from Dundee that showed in the uh, British Journal of um, Bone and Joint Surgery that we should be pinning most of these. Uh, and in terms of the posterior sloping angle, uh, people do measure that. Um, I think there's a bit of an issue with its reliability, but between 11 and 14 degrees, if there was an increase in the posterior sloping angle on the left side, uh, that's another reason to consider pinning. Yeah, okay. So we've got about a minute left. You talked about the anterior approach. Um, would you briefly like to tell me about the anterior approach to the hip? Uh, yeah, the anterior approach to the hip uh, is the modified Smith-Peterson approach for me. I'd use a bikini incision. Uh, I'd be separating sartorius from tensor fascia lata. Uh, in this case, I would split the iliac apophysis. I'd identify the rectus femoris tendon, divide it at both its heads, uh, push rectus down, and then I'm onto the capsule. So I'd be watching out for the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh in the more superficial plane. But after that, uh, you've got the branch of the uh, femoral artery, the circumflex but nothing else that you're really going to injure. Okay. Um, why do a lot of us choose the anterior approach rather than um, doing a surgical hip dislocation? What's the big advantage, do you think? Um, I think one of the things is really that we're using the anterior approach so often. I think the surgical dislocation, the evidence for that uh, is still very controversial. So most units that have reported their evidence or their results outside of burn have had high rates of avascular necrosis, yeah. Uh, whereas the Bernese group have said it's zero. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. So I think that covers skiffies. Um, and so everyone can see, well, and it went straight to the diagnosis. I mean, it is obvious you're not going to see much more of a more obvious diagnosis x-rays than that. So it's important you tell the diagnosis to show that you know it, show he mentioned the Southwick angle, um, that he knew what it was and that it was a severe one. And then going through the fact that it is controversial, and that is one of the most important things I think that we wanted to get across, that this is a massively controversial subject. And you, you cannot say anything too wrong in this as long as you back it up. Um, a lot of people would pin that insight to you and then deal with the consequences, and you, that is not wrong in the same way that if you have worked somewhere and happy going through um, done osteotomies, that is not wrong, but you need to be able to back it up. Um, mentioned about AVN rates and started talking about the literature when we had gone through everything. 
um, and gone through the risk factors. So you've got all the main points and you can see Anish answered that in four minutes. And so guys, what, you know, what we'd want you to take from this is slip tremor epiphysis. You're going to talk about the slip angle. You're going to talk about stability and chronicity and then your treatment options, which are pinning in situ, uh, a corrective osteotomy, which could be intra or extra capsular. And really, uh, once you talk about those things with the risk factors, that's you easily passed. So hopefully uh, that's slips covered. That really is as much as you need to know in a viva setting. Yeah. Any questions on that one? Uh, Luke's put here, is it reasonable to suggest open reduction if closed reduction not possible? Ah, oh, Luke. Yeah. Luke. Um, you might notice that I didn't mention closed reduction, okay? Uh, there's this whole thing people say, oh, if there's a serendipitous reduction when I put them on a traction table, don't do it, okay? Yeah. You are not going to, uh, in the exam, just don't say, you are going to say, I will not attempt to close reduction. In real life, some people argue that if it's a genuine acute slip with no chronic element to it, you could try a reduction in the first 24 hours. I think that's controversial. What do you think, Joe? Yeah, do not mention that in the exam. Um, yeah. In reality, I've had it once um, and I was planning doing surgical hip dislocation and it just popped back in and my registrar says that click that he felt will live with him for the rest of his life. Um, but actually it was brilliant. It clicked back exactly perfectly right, but that was just luck. Do not try and reduce it and certainly don't say it in the exam. That's opening up a big can of worms. And so we've got... Um... I'm allowed to say names, so they're putting them there. AJ, should it? Should I mention loader classification or name it? Yeah, okay. If you read Loader's paper, it was rubbish. He was yeah. talking about closed reductions on these hips, which is my quite them. I mean, I shouldn't say that we're recording this. It's a really good paper. It's revolutionized uh, practice and understanding, but there were weaknesses in it, but you should definitely mention it. Um, but what I'm hoping is as soon as I said stable and unstable, uh, it became clear. One of the things to clarify is you might have heard me say, can he stand upright with even two people holding on to him? That is a stable slip. OK, if they can stand upright, weight bearing on their good leg, then it's a stable slip. Um, there's this whole thing about they should be able to walk with crutches. It's not. If you've got a broken, if you've got a fractured neck of femur um, that is completely displaced, no one can hold you upright. OK, so that's what an unstable slip is. Natasha, when pinning in situ with one screw, when you take screw out and evidence, uh, a lot of us, uh, Joe, I don't know what you do. We don't take the screw out unless it's causing any issues, leave yeah. it alone. But the hip guys, uh, I love the hip arthroplasty surgeon who said to me, leave them in, we can take them out if we have to do a THR. Yeah. Uh, Darren Ebrio, Parsh. Um, Parsh has kind of fallen out of favor, okay? So this is the whole concept of the finger of God. So if you get in there within that 24 hours, you open up the capsule, release the blood, and then use a finger just to push on that femoral neck to reduce it. It is only within the first 24 hours for an acute slip, not an acute on chronic. And they're um, really rare, really yeah. rare. And again, don't be getting into that in your exam. No. So you can see we kind of just stayed in one zone. Even things like uh, how many threads are you going to put across to the epiphysis. Mm -hmm. I always find that a bit pointless because you're, you're trying to aim at 90 degrees to the epiphysis and then you get in as many as you safely can. If that's three, that's three. If it's five, that's great. Yeah, you just um, and so Luke, uh, thank you for mentioning the closed reduction because it's something we wouldn't have mentioned otherwise. So cheers. Jennifer, cool. I've previously been advised that a stable slip uh, includes being able to mobilize non-weight bearing with crutches. No, this is what we were saying actually, Jennifer. So there was, it was really interesting at BizCos, our Children's Orthopedic Society in 90, 2019, they actually did a kind of vote on that. Uh, and people felt that that's what a stable slip was. It's not. If you can stand with people holding you up, uh, that is a stable slip. You don't have to walk. Okay, you don't need crutches. Think about your old grannies when you're on your trauma on your on call. They're not going anywhere with their fractured knots, are they? This is exactly the same if it's an acute unstable and it's wobbling around all over the place. It's painful. They don't want to move. Right, and then we've got a couple of other questions coming in. Mohammed. Asuka, do we need to know about the new devices such as the um, sliding screws? Just mentioning that, okay, Mohammed, if you throw that in, that is absolutely fine. What you do need to know is what size screw you're going to be using. So for a lot of us, I would use a 6.5 fully threaded. Joe, would you go same, same or big? Yep, same. Because yeah. we hear people say 4.5 and things, too small. 
Uh, but if you're going to throw in telescopic screws, that's fine. But then you might be asked about the evidence and there is none. Um, and yeah, you use them in younger children. Lambros Athanatos. Uh, uh, he's asking uh, if a delayed presentation, is it better to operate ASAP or wait a couple of weeks? And that's controversial. So you'll have heard that I said that at the beginning. Uh, the Swiss say even if it's acute, unstable, they will operate whenever they can. So that could be the next day. Uh, the Stanmore, uh, so Mr. Cattrall's kind of rationale was turn that acute into a chronic. And that's what a lot of us have been doing in this country. But there's, there's no evidence for either. But what I can tell you is that when you look at the results for the more acute surgery from everywhere else except Switzerland, the results haven't been as good. Uh, thank you. Jen. I think the thought is you're trying to get the information down by leaving it a bit. But actually, when you talk to the guys involved, a lot of it was just due to the fact they couldn't get any surgical theatre time and they, the kids ended up just sitting on the ward on traction until they could get in there. Um, and like Anish says, there's no definite proper evidence behind it. And that's the thing, okay, so guys, when you're doing your paediatric viper, we can tell if you've done a paediatric job because you'll talk with much less certainty. If you've been reading Miller uh, and you've been reading Banaskovich, you'll talk with such certainty, everyone will know straight away that you've not done any peds. Uh, and what you're going to hear a lot of today is, and that's controversial. Right, so Radhakrishnan, really good question. When you pin in situ uh, and when getting the threads in the epiphysis, will it not make the head rotate? It doesn't because most of these have a chronic element. And that's the problem. When you, when you open up these hips and you're looking at this epiphysis, it is stuck. Trying to actually move it is hard. So no, uh, it doesn't rotate around as you'd think. Peter Riddleston, do we need to know the details of the osteotomies? if you're going for a gold medal, okay? Otherwise, that's why what you'll have heard I said, and this is what you know I'd say to my trainees, is just go with, you could go intracapsular or pin in situ, then do an extracapsular, okay? Uh, the principle is neck shortening because in that chronic situation, you wanna shorten the neck so you take off the tension of the blood supply at the back so that you reduce the risk of avian. Uh, Shinil Koshi, management in chronic slip with mild exacerbations, pinning with osteotomy. Um, so again, people for mild and moderates have done pinning in situ and then done some sort of osteoplasty. Uh, for the FRCS, I wouldn't go down that, okay? I would, I think it'd be safest to say mild and moderate slips, just pin in situ, full stop. Would you agree, Joe? Yeah, definitely. And you're getting advice from your tertiary paediatric centre um, um, for anything moderate or severe, aren't you? Um, and as long as you said that, remember the FRCS is for day one consultant being safe. Um, you are not going to be doing these. Um, just say, just mention it and say, you know, the principles behind it. These are blah, blah, blah. And then last question. I think we better move on after this. Yeah. Uh, McKenna, you said after how long do you remove the screw after inside you pinning? Uh, as we were saying, we don't, unless it's causing a problem. Um, and it's a real pain to find these screws and remove yeah. them. Having said that, last question, uh, Kurum Rashid, uh, if chondrolysis happens, what can be done? This is not FRCS uh, mm. level, okay, but so how can you avoid chondrolysis? Theoretically, by not perforating the femoral head, but it's surprising, I, I might regret saying this, but it's not that common. No, AVN is more common. Yeah. That is your big worry with the skiffy, not chondrolysis. And that's the situation in which okay. you probably Should have to the move the screw. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but in which case they're probably going for a hip replacement anyway. Okay, let's go for the next one. Okay, so this is a 14 month old little girl who's been brought into your clinic um, and GP's just worried about the way she's walking. How would you approach this? Um, so I would start obviously by taking a full history and examination with this 14 month old girl. Um, I'd want to talk to the parents, ask whether this is their first child. Uh, I would want to know whether there were any problems during the pregnancy itself. Was this a normal delivery? Was she in a breech position? Uh, is there any family history of DDH? Um, and how has she been over those 14 months? Has she been developing normally? I'd expect all the answers to those questions to be norm, uh, to be yes. Uh, I would ask if she was breech and if she was, did she have hip screening? Um, uh, and the reason why I'd ask all these questions is you can see looking at the x-ray that she's got a dislocated left hip. This looks congenital to me. The ossific nucleus is smaller on the left than the right. 
you've got an increased acetabular index on that left side suggesting acetabular dysplasia. Uh, and this is in the um, fourth quadrant of TONIS. Okay, good. Um, as you said, she's got a left dislocated hip and she's 14 months. Um, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to tell mum that your plan is? So at 14 months, there are a couple of approaches that people adopt. One would be to get in there at this stage. Um, personally, that's what I would do. The other approach would be to wait until 18 months uh, and perform an open reduction with a soltrostrotomy. That's what Salter described. Uh, at this stage, I would like to talk to them about the importance of putting the hip back. I'd explain that if we leave as is, she will start walking uh, and she has been walking, but she's likely to develop problems as she gets older with her back and maybe even her hip becoming arthritic if she develops a pseudoacetabulum. Uh, I'd like to perform an EUA, an arthrogram, with a view to trying to perform a close reduction in the first instance. If this was successful, I personally would perform an adductor and so as tenotomy and put her in a hip spiker. I am aware that there was uh, the biggest series of this has been from Stanmore. Uh, so Sally Tennant and Deborah East would publish this. And actually, when they are in this quadrant, the results aren't so good. There is a higher rate of ABN. Um, if the closed reduction was unsuccessful, then I'd be looking at doing an open reduction uh, instead. OK. Um, and you've talked to me before about your approach to um, doing an open reduction, um, the anterior approach. Um, you said a salter osteotomy. What other osteotomies do you know that can be used? Or is that your one of choice? Uh, that would be my one of choice. I am aware that um, some people perform a femoral osteotomy. So um, it does depend. You can judge this by performing a test of stability, as described by Tony Cattrall. Um, but sometimes it's the femur where you might want to put in a bit of varus and do a derotation to correct the femoral antiversion. Uh, or you address the acetabulum and what you're doing is um, uh, making up that deficient anterior coverage. So that could be with a sole osteotomy. The other ones I'm aware of are the Pemberton osteotomy and also the Dagar as tradition as actually described by Dagar and not the modifications. But that can, if you put your wedges uh, more anteriorly than posteriorly, can provide anterior coverage. Yeah. OK. Um, what about your treatment after that? You do the operation and then that's all um, you do? Yeah, well, so uh, I would normally put them in a hip spiker, so a one and a half spiker down to the ankle on the left, to the knee on the right, and then perform some form of uh, axial imaging to check my reduction. Uh, usually we find CT is just easier to obtain than MRI scan. Um, and if that looks okay, then I'd normally bring the patient back at six weeks for a change of spiker and an EUA arthrogram. Okay. All right. I think, should we go on to doing um, questions and stuff on that? Because I think everyone can see how you can answer DDH questions like that so easy. Anish obviously knows what he's talking about, but um, he'd gone through everything, exactly how to treat a delayed mispresentation of a DDH. Um, It'd be really embarrassing if I was getting it wrong. I mean, if I'm missing yeah, things, you won't point it out, won't you, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I can't see the questions, so do you yeah. want... uh, nothing's come through, guys. Questions, DDH. This is your chance. Fire away. Right. What are the degrees of flexion? This is McKenna again. Uh, oh no, sorry. Hang on, I've missed one. Uh, Kazi Masood, would you still do an acetabular osteotomy after a closed reduction? How do you decide acetabular versus femoral? Okay. Uh, my personal feeling uh, for the FRCS is, you know, just like you're going to say, you'd always do an Exeter hip replacement. Just say you always do a sole trostrotomy. Uh, I think that might be the safest thing so that you don't get into this. Do I do the femur? Do I do the pelvis? After the age of two, you should say, I'm aware that I might need to do a femoral shortening as well as an acetabular osteotomy. Um, in terms of how we do decide, there is that test of stability. So what Mr. Cattrall described was once you've done your open reduction, if all it needs is abduction and uh, a bit of internal rotation, you do the femur. And if you need flexion, then you do a, a pelvic osteotomy, something like a Salter. McKenna, what are the degrees of flexion, ER and abduction of that hip while putting for DDH? So remember, it's is it really you're using II and just checking which position it's best in, but it will be internal rotation, not external rotation. Okay, so your femoral head's pointing anteriorly, you're trying to keep it in. Um, any evidence on maintaining reduction with wires? Um, 
it, there is a paper from Columbia, I think it was, where they talked about pinning the femoral head to the acetabulum. I think you will raise eyebrows and possibly fail your paediatric station okay. if you mention that. Yeah. Uh, the only time I've ever put wires in is in revision ones. They are very unusual ones and certainly don't go up the neck into the acetabulum. Um, I actually coincidentally did put a wire in one a couple of days ago, but that is, we put it from the iliac crest into the greater trochanter um, in a particularly difficult DDH one. And it's very unusual. Do not go into that. Um, do not do it. Then Abdallah, you've asked immediate closed or open reduction or wait until 18 months. That's one of the controversies. Okay. So uh, I think every, what would you do, Joe? So I would uh will not wait but by the time they actually get to the operating theater with a bit of an elective waiting list there'll be 18 months given that they're 14 months but what would you do if they were 12 months would you go in or would yeah you... see my protocol is very slightly different to yours i um we go in and, and do an open reduction at the age of 12 months um i wouldn't do a pelvic osteotomy until the age of yeah past 18 months closer to two yeah. but actually a lot of the evidence shows that pelvic remodeling goes on um, we don't know exactly how long and there's lots of controversy about that maybe up to the age of four um, and the bony what you see on the bony side of it isn't actually what is often there um, you're putting dye into the hip they've got a lot of cartilaginous cover um, so you don't often need to do a pelvic osteotomy I am much more likely to do a femoral osteotomy in which case I would do that at the age of 12 months um, so like Anish said before, there is so much controversy about all this paediatric stuff, but as long as you say what you would do or what you have seen being done, that is fine. Um, I think that's the thing. So yeah, I would do the same actually at 12 months. If I fail a closed reduction earlier, I do an, an open reduction and nothing else. You normally, because the earlier you put the hip back, the more remodeling potential you've got in my mind, yeah. but you could say anything really. The only problem with a pelvic osteotomy before the age of 18 months is the pelvis is so thin, it's just hard taking your graft and trying to get it to stay there. But some people do do it. Yeah. Uh, Chanel Koshi, after closed reduction and EUA spiker, would you do axial scanning immediately? Yes. Personally, it depends on how confident I am. But yeah, I think just say yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would you, you, explain... you can go to a CT scanner from recovery on the way back to the ward. Uh, Mohammed Asker. Would you please explain what we need to know about arthrogram for the exam? I think you need to be able to talk through the approach you'd use. So I'd use a medial approach, uh, putting my needle underneath the adductor tendons, squirting some joint uh, arth arthrogram dye into the joint. And for DDH, you're looking for those blocks to reduction. Okay, so you're looking for the inverted labrum. Uh, you're looking for that rose thorn sign. You're looking for the hourglass constriction. Um, is there an age limit for attempting closed reduction? Not really. I think most of us think that after age 18 months and beyond, it's getting less likely. Yeah, uh, we certainly had a couple over the age of two, but it is yeah. rarer. Um, yeah. And some people, I think in Southampton, the guys were saying they've stopped doing closed reductions. They just yeah. do open reductions. Yeah. Uh, Akash, what's the advantage of performing an arthrogram before and after hip spike reduction? You need to do the arthrogram for a closed reduction uh, just so you can be sure that the femoral head is actually in because you can't see it's cartilaginous. And even with an open reduction, often once we repaired the capsule, I like to squirt some dye back in just mm -hmm. to really check because it's really hard. You get a small view of this acetabulum. You don't, it's not like a surgical dislocation where you might have the whole thing exposed. So that's why I think an arthrogram helps. Do we, we need actually to... put a little epidural catheter in? Um, All right. And so we can squirt a little bit of dye in when we've got the spiker on, if we're particularly worried about it. Oh, cool. See, there you go. I'm learning as well. Do we need to talk about examination of child in viva? Uh, that was no man. You could. Uh, I kind of skipped that, um, but you could say so I'd expect there to be a shortened leg uh, with restricted abduction inflection. Um, someone's put, please tell us more about arthrogram. We've done that. Uh, a, uh, Ajay, is Degar for CP post super deficiency? So that's what everyone says. But if you read Degar's paper, and actually it was Joe's colleague, Marcus, who put me on to this because he's a big fan of the Degar. Yeah. Um, and the, the big advantage of the Degar is you don't have to put wires or anything and it's a stable osteotomy. And essentially you are breaking in the same line as a Salter, but you choose where you go through the medial cortex. But guys, this is getting way too advanced for yeah, uh, FRTS. A uh, comment on difference between closed reduction under sedation in the ward. You don't do it. You don't do it. 
Yeah. yeah um, it doesn't exist. So you, yeah, McKenna, you've obviously seen this somewhere where they're using uh, ultrasound. I don't think that would be common practice and I would stay away from talking about that. Jennifer, if given the case of a, say, 10-month-old with DDH, could you argue for immediate attempt at close reduction, if not comfortable remedial approach, or just wait until 12 months and do anterior? I think that's down to the individual surgeon. I would definitely go for a close reduction in that first instance. And if that fails, then look at an anterior open. Um, I don't, I always advise people to stay away from the medial approach in the um, viva. It's one less thing for you to learn. And you just say there's a very high rate of AVN. Even if you, if, as long as you follow up the kid, you'll find there's some AVN. And so uh, it's preferred not to do it. Joe, do you ever do the medial open approach? Uh, very, very rarely. Um, I'm much happier doing the anti approach. You can get much better visualization of the acetabulum. It's just, it's just what we're more all used to. And like you say, AVN rates, why not, not just wait a couple of months and do it with a lower risk of AVN? Um, I think what we haven't talked about is public harnesses. Um, yeah. You have to know what a public harness is, what the different straps do to get the flexion, to get the abduction. Um, the fact you are not going to use it over the age of six months. Um, and you need to know if you're shown an ultrasound of a hip, roughly what you're looking at. I would not expect you to be able to go exactly through what an, what an ultrasound, all the tiny little bits of ultrasound. Um, I would expect you to know graph. I would expect you to know the varying degrees um, of it. But She's not harsh. Really had to do it. Sorry? I say you're harsh. Um, <laughs> and then Panagiotis, you've said if the closed open reduction is not successful, then what? Then you try, try again. Okay, if closed doesn't work, you are going to open. If, you know, if, you're, if you've done an open reduction and the hip is not stable, that's when you're considering your osteotomies. Remember, the osteotomies aren't just to correct bony anatomy, it's to make the hip stable. Uh, but it does happen. And then we have to go back to theatre with another plan. Um, and I, I think it's happened to all of us. Mm -hmm. Which die do you use? Omnipake? Yes. yes. Uh, someone's put here approach for open reduction. We talked about the anterior approach. It's the anterior approach. But remember to talk about splitting the iliac apophysis. A lot of people who haven't done or seen an open approach forget to talk about the iliac apophysis. For infection, you don't need to split it. You do for DDH surgery. Uh, Al has asked why we, I prefer a medial approach for arthrogram. Do you use a medial approach as well, Joe? Yeah, always go under the adductus tendon, aim up for ipsilateral scapula. It's just a lot easier in babies. Yeah, I think when you're trying to, there's a small space for that anterior femoral neck. And if you're trying to bounce it, it's cartilage. So it doesn't work so well. Whereas the medial approach, there's just nothing in the way. Um, would you still put a pavlik in a dislocated hip? Um, I would put it on and then ultrasound it the following week to see whether it's back in. And you do your ortolani and barlow to try and get it in. Um, obviously, if it's a kind of a teratogenic one, one that is not going anywhere, no. Um, but I, I would give it two weeks of trying to go in and to centralize. Um, Andrew Hughes, why must you wait until 18 months to perform the anterior approach? It's not the anterior approach, it's actually, the it's the Salter. And that's why you need to wait until 18 months. Uh, Mehdi has put, from what age will you consider closed reduction? Uh, that's a really good question, actually. So Graf never put a Graf for, he says, in a public harness. He takes them for a, a closed reduction. Um, for me, so you'll see Mr. Cattrall is a big influence in my life because he used to visit us at the North Cumberland Norwich. Uh, and he said, wait till five or six months. And that's what we do, uh, okay. especially because you're doing tenotomies. It's amazing how easy it is to get lost in the medial part of a baby's thigh. Would you normally wait until five or six months, Joe? Yeah, or you wait until six months. Yep. Close six months. And um, then, it's so far anesthetically as well. The anesthetists are much happier to gas a woman age. Yeah. Uh, James Houston, why do you need to split the iliac apophysis? So you will all tell me that you're going to go in the uh, plane between gluteus medius and uh, rectus femoris, which is the superior gluteal nerve and the femoral nerve. But that's the way you separate the two, okay? Your abductors are attached to that outer table of the um, ileum. So when you split the apophysis and you go subperiosteal, you take everything off and it all can then peel off the capsule. Uh, McKenna, comment on man- All the way around the capsule, you've got to be able to get all the way laterally and medially. And you'll see when you're draining a septic kit, you cannot get that visualization of that capsule without splitting the apophysis. Yeah. So you have to do that. Then McKenna has asked on the management of teratologic dislocated hip. 
Uh, the things to say there, public harnesses, I still give it a go, but it's less successful. Same with closed reduction, still give it a go, but it's going to be less successful. So you're really you're, you're looking more likely at open surgery with or without osteotomies. But it does depend on the cause, okay? So some people would say something like spina bifida, that's a controversial one. Some people say don't put them back, especially if it's bilateral. Uh, and others say you should try. So I think that one you've got to just say that these are the, the, the uncertainties. Rather Christian, and if you see a child at six months, the hip is still dislocated, would you do an EUA and ask for a gram and reduce the hip and put him in a spiker? Yes. Yeah. Later you find it's dislocated at six weeks follow up. Uh, would you wait till 12 months to do an open reduction or do it straight away at eight months? I would wait. I would wait too. Yeah. Mainly the risk of AVN. If you're going back in on there, you're going to increase your risk of AVN by messing it around. You might as well just go back in and do it properly. And it might have matured a bit and you get a better close reduction even when you do it at 12 months. And whatever you do, if you're asked in the advisor, if they say, look, you did a close reduction, post-op CT shows it's out, what are you going to do? I would not say I'm going to try another close reduction. Okay, you have to say, well, I'm assuming that I did everything well the first time, so why would it work a second time? I'm listing them for an open reduction. Um, in terms well, of- You're not going to be asked this in the FRCS. If you're getting onto this sort of thing, they've run out of things to ask you and you've got no. Yeah. Um, do I consent for closed and open at the same time? Depends on the case, but yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, how do you assess femoral antiversion during surgery? You're really, you're looking at the hip stability, but it's really difficult. Okay. So when you're trying to work out how much to derotate, everyone has their own system, putting wires in the femur and stuff. Um, it's all a little bit voodoo. Mm. Uh, and then two last questions. Okay. Cause we've really covered this. Is there an option of other brace in failed public harness or straight away consider closed reduction? Very good question uh, from Pratik. Some people do try rigid bracing. Um, some people go straight to close reduction. Rami, do you start treatment early in life for graft type two or do you repeat ultrasound at six weeks? I would repeat ultrasound at six weeks, but um, what do you do, Joe, if you see a graft uh, two, uh, age three? Two, a, two B, uh, yeah, I would repeat it. Um, if they're at 12 weeks and they are not getting any better, then um, I would think about putting them in a public harness. It's very controversial and we're actually starting hopefully an RCT, um, which hopefully will be nationwide to get some questions about that. Um, but you will not be asked that in your FLCS. Right, guys, no more questions, yeah. please. Otherwise you won't get to hear about anything. So I'll just answer the last, if I just answer the last three, right. uh, how long for the public harness? Again, controversial. I would say until the hip looks completely normal and then just stop. In an exam, say you're going to scan it every two weeks and when it's normal, you discontinue. CT scan after closed and open reductions. Uh, at two months follow-up in public harness, the hip is dislocated. Uh, so Radha Krishnan, if it was dislocated at two weeks, you shouldn't carry on, okay? No. You would do, put your graph for in a public and if at two weeks it's not reducing, might not be normal, but if it's not centering, you will discontinue the public harness, okay? Um, Protocol of immobilization after closed open reduction is a hip spiker. And why is the left side common to dislocate? People think it's because of the left hip being rubbed up against mum's sacrum. Really, no one knows. Yeah. Right, we're going to end the questions there for DDH, otherwise we won't really talk about the other things. Okay. Here we go. So this is, you're on the neonatal unit and Mum didn't attend any of her antenatal appointments at all, and baby has popped out looking like this. Um, Paediatricians are completely happy and feel that this is an isolated problem. What do you think? Right, um, so this is a clinical photograph um, of a baby's legs. The most striking abnormality here is bilateral club foot, so congen congenital telepes equina varus. Um, I'm a bit concerned looking at these limbs, uh, looking at the size of the feet in relation to both tibia and both thighs. They're, they're just, it doesn't look right. There seems to be um, hypoplasia of the muscles at the thighs. Um, and I'd be wondering whether this is, uh, whether there's a syndromic cause behind this rather than an idiopathic club foot. Okay. Um, what mum's asking about what treatment you can give for the club feet are her feet always going to look like this uh no i'd explain that actually um the most club feet especially if they're idiopathic uh are successfully treated by the ponsetti method which is a sequence of plaster changes 
uh, we'll be doing that. We can start that as soon as baby is well enough. So if there are no other problems with this baby, we could do that within the next week or so. Uh, and it's a series of plaster casts and we perform a correction in a sp specific sequence. So you're looking at uh, correct, we're supinating the first ray first, then you're gonna correct the varus. And the last thing you then bring up is correcting the equinus. I'd explain that 90% of babies will need an Achilles tenotomy, which we'd usually perform in clinic under local anesthetic. Uh, usually it's six weeks of plaster casting, providing everything's coming along okay. And then they'd go into um, the final plaster for three weeks and then boots and bars, uh, which will be full time and then uh, nights and naps only until the age of five. And with this, there's about a 90% success rate. Okay. Um what, why why did you get club feet? Do you know any, any reasons why they think? Um, it's, again, it's something that we don't really know. We know that there are various uh, theories about this. What we do know is that the whole leg from below the knee is abnormal. Studies have shown that certain muscle compartments, so the lateral compartment and the anterior compartment are underdeveloped. Uh, about 50% of these children are also missing their dorsalis pedis pulse. So we know there are genetic factors. It's more common in boys and this condition demonstrates the Carter effect. Um, and we know that it does run in families, but it's the Carter effect that it explains why it skips generations. We know that there's an increase in myofibroblasts when you look at this tissue histologically, um, but really we don't know why it occurs. It's not a packaging disorder. Okay, are there any other associations? Anything else you'd be worried about? You said you'd worry about other syndromes. Um, anything else you would routinely look at? Uh, so one of the controversial associations is DDH. Uh, there are various papers, papers published uh, by Robin Payton, that suggest that there isn't a genuine association between clubfoot and DDH, but I believe most people uh, and most units do still scan children born with, DD, uh, with clubfoot for DDH. With these children, I would do a full head to toe examination. I'd also be looking for external signs of spinal deformity and dysraphism uh, to exclude conditions like spina bifida. Um, and yeah, here I'm just still wondering whether these are featureless limbs. I'm not seeing lots of creases. And every time I see a bilateral uh, congenital telepes equina varus, I'd be thinking about arthrogryposis. Yeah. Good. Um, okay, any questions that have come through? Yeah, there are a few. Okay. Uh, so, Kurum, I thought this pick of arthrogryposis, that's what I was wondering. Uh, I didn't want to jump in with it because I wasn't completely sure. Is it arthrogryposis, Joe? Yeah, I think it, I think it is arthrogryposis. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, what is the Carter effect? Basically, the Carter effect is a genetic thing where uh, a certain amount, uh, so you have a, a certain amount of genetic load and you need differing amounts of genetic load to manifest the phenotype. So in clubfoot, the theory is uh, females can have that the same amount of genetic load, but not demonstrate the condition, whereas uh, a male will have that and demonstrate the condition. So it explains why you can have conditions that are more common in one gender than the other, but without having a, a relationship to the sex chromosomes. Um, Keith, ideal answer if asked about management of bilateral club feet presenting late in a teenager. You are not going to get that. <laughs> okay. Um, and that's really controversial. Uh, I would, let's yeah. not go there. You're Everyone not. knows the answer is frames, but we won't talk about that. Yeah. Uh, Kurum, why yes, caves club foot happens in spinal dysraphism. Do you know, mate, the honest answer of all of these things, none of us know, but it's to do with muscle imbalances. And why is Ponsetti cast extended above the knee? It's to provide that rotational stability. It's really important. People have mucked around with all of those things and found it doesn't work. You've got to do it above the knee. Cool. Is that all of them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. a couple more. Um, okay. Do we need to know the genetic associations? Not really, just say no. it runs in families. For the less astute of us, what are the hints in this photo that this is arthrogryposis? It, you know, it's a tricky one. And that's why I was a little bit unsure, but those legs just don't look normal. Normally that have very chubby thighs. What we talk about is the lack of skin creases and the featureless, uh, if you look at these, they just look tubular and shiny. Uh, and I think that's what would make you think it's arthrogryposis. And bilateral, uh, very severe club feet as well, which should always ring. ring yeah. Well. Something um, you haven't talked about is the Pirani score. Yeah. Um, Someone's so just put that. A way out of six, you get three points for the um, three posterior um, 
elements, so the empty heel, posterior crease, um, and the rigid equinus, and then three points for the medial or the midfoot, so the medial crease, the uncovered tailor head, and the medial um, lateral curve border. And so that's a way of looking at these club feet right from the start to the finish, and the physios grade them at each time just to make sure that everything is going well. And it's not until you've got rid of all of the three midfoot things that you can consider doing your um, Achilles tenotomy. So um, I wouldn't expect you to know much about the prior score, but I would expect you to know that it exists and it's a way of kind of monitoring the progress of these club feet. Um, McKenna has put Pitex uh, in terms of the gene. So yeah, if you know it, throw it in. Uh, Ajay has asked about scoring. Uh, Joe's just answered that. Uh, no man, what is the age and indication of doing post remedial release? There are very few indications. Okay, Ponsetti is the main one. I, th I think the only indication would be failed Ponsetti multiple times. So it's the syndromic feet. Um, we just don't do post remedial releases anymore. They're, they're not done. And the only one we've seen is in one that was a really abnormal foot with multiple tarsal coalitions. And yes. Just not. And so normally they're about 18 months by the time you've tried the Ponsetti a few times and then gone in to do that. Uh, Tibant transfer, so depending on what you read, uh, someone's put a Tibant transfer question mark. Yes, 25 to 30%. Uh, Shinil, uh, Joe's answered your question about Pirani. So you don't need to know it in detail, but just be able to name it. Um, Kuram, if clubfoot is part of arthrogryposis, would you treat with Ponsetti? Yeah, there, there are papers on using Ponsetti for syndromic club feet. Uh, you do give it a go. There are various tips and tricks that the uh, Ponsetti purists know about. I'm not one of them. Um, and the main thing, if someone asks you, is that you're going to probably be using more plaster casts. That's the main the thing. The rates are much higher. For it as well. um, Thomas has put, speaking of arthrogryposis, how in-depth should we know about it? I wouldn't go into masses of detail, okay? But you need to know that there's the distal type, uh, there's a the complex type, and just that it can cause teratologic hip dislocations it can cause knee extension deformities and clubfoot. Uh, management of residual deformity at older age, Tamara has asked. I think there are various osteotomies, fusions. Uh, the Tiban transfer is the main one I think they'll ask you about. Okay, and that would be it. Uh, Rami, what if casting failed or late presentation? Any role for gradual correction of external fixation? Depends on who you speak to. I think definitely so. Yeah. Um, Joe says so as well. And out in, several of our colleagues have gone out to Africa um, and they are very, very pro doing Ponsetti casting almost at any age. And they have seen it work um, late teens, early 20s. So it's a quick, easy thing to do. Um, whereas putting frames on is horrible. Um, and yeah, it's worth doing Ponsetti first, I would. Yeah. Um, so McKenna's put, please explain what exactly is a rock of bottom deformity. So that's where you're basically uh, trying to correct that equinus, but rather than correcting the equinus, you're doing it through the midfoot. Um, and that's not a good thing to do. Um, should we mention doing x-rays, Jahan has said. So actually, um, if you're being really good with your evidence and saying, actually, I know that John Hertzenberg uh, in Baltimore uses x-rays uh, to assess whether Achilles tenotomy is required, then yes, but not just for measuring feet, not just for diagnosis. Uh, McKenna's asked about the exact difference between residual recurrent and resistant CTV. And apparently you've forgotten two more R's. Do you know anything about this five R's, Joe? Five R's? No. No. So I'm just guessing here, McKenna. Residual means it's still there's still a little bit of deformity when you finished. Recurrent means you got it better and then it's come back. And resistant means you never got it better to begin with because it was probably syndromic. I've never heard of that, so you'll have to teach us about that one. Yeah. Pratik, how to diagnose dynamic supination clinically. When you watch them walk, they kind of lift that first ray like that. That's all it is. And if you get them dorsiflex, they'll kind of do that. So that's just literally supination. Man, McKenna, I don't know what you've been reading, but you've got more knowledge than I have. Do we need to know PAVER score, P-A-V-E-R in capitals? Never heard of it. For the older CTV. No. I'm going to take that no. as a no. Uh, Martina? Yeah would allow weight bearing if using Ponsetti in an older child? Uh, good question. Um, I think it can be hard to control that. You go with above knee plasters, they probably won't walk, they'll crawl around and I think you've got to accept that that's what's gonna happen. 
I think right. the only thing we haven't covered that I would like to say is the boots and but the highest rate of recurrence is non-compliance. So right from the start, you need to tell the parents they need to keep this kid in boots and bars, nights and nap times. And if they don't, their feet will recur. Okay. Right, it's 8.20. Right. So should we do one more and yeah. then throw it open to everyone else? Yeah. Um, okay, uh, it says seven-year-old boy. Um, he's actually the son of one of our local GPs. Um, wants to play for West Ham, um, like his two twin sisters. And he's been complaining of severe left hip pain. Um, for the last few months. Um, he's clinically very well, got no other medical problems. So um, this is an AP pelvis and it shows that this seven year old boy has perthase due tip. Um, Shenton's line is intact, but you can see that if you look at the lateral pillar, there's over 50% loss of height. So this is a herring C. There are some head at risk signs. I can see metaphyseal cyst. I do wonder if there's some lateral epiphyseal calcification. Um, and so I'd want to know a little bit more about this child in terms of working out what I'd be in terms of my management. Okay, he comes in sitting in a wheelchair. He's very reluctant to wait there on this at all. Um, he holds the hip um, in about 10 degrees of adduction and does not like you moving it at all. Um, he used to comply with physio, um, but not anymore. Right. Um, it's, it's unusual to have that degree of hip pain in this uh, kind of condition with perthase, so I'd be a bit concerned about this. Is he systemically well? Yes, completely, yep. Right. Um, and so it sounds like this is clinically also a head at risk. So he's got progressive loss of range of movement. It sounds like he's got an adduction contracture. Uh, and so perthase is really controversial. Uh, people really don't know what the ideal treatment would be. Given his gender, and his age, he should have a good outcome, even if we do nothing. But based on the x-ray, and especially the clinical picture that you described, um, I'd be more likely to consider operative intervention. I'm aware that there is very little evidence that this would improve the outcome, but especially if he's struggling this much, I think um, this is the kind of child I'd, I'd consider admitting for traction um, and maybe going further with that. But it depends on how we can control his symptoms and getting complying with physiotherapy. Okay. Do you know anything about the etiology of Perthes disease? Um, there have been various theories. Uh, the biggest associations we have are with uh, passive smoking and lower socioeconomic class. Um, Professor Dan Perry from Alderhey has published a lot of work on Perthes, uh, and one of his most recent studies in the Bone and Joint Journal showed that uh, there is definitely a link with being from a low, lower socioeconomic class but they couldn't separate the effect of that from the effect of passive smoking. Uh, I'm aware that there's also been the BOSS study, uh, which has just reported its preliminary results, but this was a longitudinal study survey. It was basically a survey or a registry of all kids with Perthes disease uh, over a two year period. Okay. Good. Um, any questions from what's in Perthes, the ultimate treatment goal um, what, so, what do you aim to do with it? Uh, my treatment goal would be containment. That's the main principle. Uh, we need to keep the femoral head within the acetabulum. Uh, usually this would be with physiotherapy. Uh, I ask them to stretch the adductor muscles so that they've got good abduction and keeping that femoral head moving into the acetabulum. If that's not working, there are various other approaches that have been described. Some people have described tenotomies of the adductor tendon and then broomstick plasters or A-frame braces. Others have talked about uh, various osteotomies of the femur. Benjamin Joseph has written up a big series on those from Manipal. Uh, others have talked about using a soldier osteotomy or a shelf. Uh, and some people put all of these things together. Uh, there is no evidence that any one of these is better than any others. What are you going to tell the parents um, about this? They want them going back to football um, and they want the quick fix. What's the quickest way of get, doing that? Uh, I'd have to explain to them that there is no quick fix in this situation. Perthes disease uh, lasts about three years. You've got the various stages. You've got the initial stage where you've got sclerosis, then fragmentation, uh, then healing, and then the remodeling phase. Altogether, that will take about three years. Uh, the pain and stiffness normally lasts for about a year and a half, and it's very variable. Even if we do an operation, that's not going to make this, uh, well, the evidence there is controversial. Most people don't think it accelerates healing, 
there is some evidence from Benjamin Joseph's uh, study group and from uh, Sheffield Children's Hospital where they use hip distractors that it can uh, accelerate healing. But uh, as far as this family is concerned, I would not be making any promises. I'd also be warning them that because you've got total physeal involvement here, I'd be worried about proximal femoral morphology abnormality as this child gets older and that they might need further surgery at that stage as well. How about the other side? Um, what yeah, it's, I'd like to see a frog lateral because sometimes it's easier to see uh, changes on a frog lateral view. Uh, again, it's about a 25 to 30% chance of having bilateral involvement. So we'll be watching for that side as we go along with time too. Do you know any um, evidence about vitamin D use with empathies? Do you know, um, I believe there is some there, but it's controversial. So some, there has been a paper, I think from India, that suggested that there is an association, um, but there's also been one that suggested there isn't. Okay, good. Um, any questions come through yet? There are. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, we have got... Dun, 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 dun. Do you know... Right, so guys, I have to say, my first thing I always say to the trainees when you answer the question about management is say containment. containment. And I'm a bit disappointed that Joe had to ask me what's the principle. Uh, so sorry about that. <laughs> right, um, where are we going? I'm trying to find where we were. Uh, Rami, any role for bisphosphonates in Perthes disease? Again, not FRCS level. People were investigating it, but the biggest problem is if you've got no blood supply to the femoral head and you inject intravenous medicines, it won't get to the femoral head. So people were talking about injecting it directly into the femoral head, but I don't think that got approval. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Alistair, how long... Bisphosphonates, if you've got, um, if you're using bisphosphonates in OI, you stop using them around the type of any fractures. You've got perthes, you've got loads of little micro fractures around the place. It just doesn't, it's not a good idea. And there's no evidence for it. Um, how long would you traction for? So Alistair, I have to be honest, I've never come across someone with such severe perthes, and I don't know if Joe, if that's what you're looking for with the traction, but um, I know that people out there do do it, and essentially it'd be until the symptoms subside, so sometimes a week or two. Some people use traction a lot. Yeah, it's, uh, I try no, to yeah, it's not something I used, but I think it's along the same principle, like you said, of the distraction X-fixes, yeah. um, just to let it settle down. No, uh, McKenna, etiology theories, the vascular theory. Uh, there are loads of theories, okay, but none of them have been proven. So we know that there's, an, uh, there's a vascular insult. You can induce this in pigs by uh, basically tying off the blood supply to the femoral head. But what causes that is the big issue. What I do love is when you look at the pathology, uh, you get more cartilage forming because cartilage withstands that ischemic environment. But then that's why you get coxa magna because the cartilage needs to be bigger because it doesn't withstand the shear forces. So that stuff makes sense to me, but I, I don't think anyone's actually explained why it happens. Uh, what herring grade would this be? C. Remember you applied the herring grade at stage of maximal fragmentation, but it's not going to get any worse than this, is it? Uh, Chenille, how to practically, practically distinguish between BC and C in an x-ray? The BC was something that was kind of added later. And when you read those herring papers, there's no clarification about what that is. So my advice would be ignore that for the exam. Lawrence, if you have a child under the age of six with a herring C, how would you manage this? I, I don't find herring particularly useful, I must say, and I think a lot of us completely ignore it. Um, my, how I would treat a child with perthes depends on whether they have whole head involvement, whether they have a load of head at wrist signs. Um, that lateral extrusion, that is always a really bad sign because it means that when that head is starting to remodel, they're going to impinge, they're going to have an awful shaped head. Um, so herring, yes, mention it, know about it, but say from experience, you know that um, pediatric orthopedic surgeons are more worried if the whole head has become avascular and you just need to get containment of that. Um, so yeah, we know that kids, no matter how old they are, if they have only a little bit that has um, sort of become avascular, they are generally gonna do well. But if they have the whole of it that is avascular, they need some help. Um, and you need to get that head in the right place, even if they're really young. Yeah, um, I think that's the thing is, um, 
that, that the problem with the herring seat with the herring classification is that thing about applying it at peak fragmentation by which stage you actually miss the boat for doing your surgical containment procedure. Uh, Agni Stutter, worth mentioning any classification other than herring. You could mention the catrol classification, um, but I personally don't think you need to go into that for FRCS. The royal how is to manage perthase conservatively. How long do you follow the patients up and how often do you image them? Uh, good questions. Also, what's your threshold finding to convert conservative management to surgery? I think we have to be clear, Herbert, there is no evidence that surgery changes anything. The BOSS study has in its preliminary results suggested that it was only a two year follow up. Uh, but having said all that, sometimes you just bite the bullet because you're watching and thinking, man, if I don't do anything and this ends up bad, it's my fault. And I think it's a combination of clinical factors as well as the x-ray. So I'm a big believer in the clinical head at risk signs and the radiographic. So if I'm seeing what Joe described, a progressively stiffening hip, uh, my worry is that actually this is a hip that is slowly subluxing and if we leave it where it is when it does reform it's not going to match the acetabulum so that's what I'm looking for so when I follow these children I see them every three months uh, with an x-ray and uh, a definite clinical examination and if we find that they're complying with physio and still stiffening up in my world that's when they're going to be looking at possible surgery. Yeah, kids that lo are losing their abduction are ones that I worry about. Um, I have quite a low threshold for Thames Theatre doing an EOA arthrogram because the anaesthetic takes away their pain. You can see their true range of movement and putting dye into the hip I find very useful. Um, I know that's a very paediatric orthopod thing to do. We love arthrogramming joints, but it's because you can just see so it gives you so much information. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Um... Herring B above the age of eight, would you operate? So Abdullah, um, again, good question. A lot of people at that age are worried. And I think if you're seeing progressive sign of femoral head collapse, uh, again, based on those head at risk signs, the older child, I would have a lower threshold to operate. Yeah, um, I'd do an EOA arthrogram, but consent them for an osteotomy at the same time. Uh, Ab uh, Kurum has said, well, I thought as differential diagnosis on first look, look like telltale sign of septic arthritis. So Kurum, I, I wasn't sure, okay? I didn't think this, to me, this isn't classic septic arthritis, but based on what Joe was describing, leukemia can also have a similar appearance. Uh, it's, you know, I've seen a case of that that one of my colleagues dealt with. And that's why I was just a little bit paranoid. And yeah, this is, this is an example of exam mode. When you're in exam mode, you're looking for the weird and wonderful. So even if it's really straightforward perthase, based on the history, I was thinking, is she trying to catch me out? Is she trying to catch me out? There's over 100 people watching. Is she going to make me look like a fool? Uh, and in exam mode, you're always looking for that rest thing. Chanel, how practical is it to maintain non-weight bearing for such long periods? Uh, you might. Uh, so we didn't talk about that. I don't keep them non-weight bearing. Okay. And if you do your grand reaction force diagrams, uh, the joint reaction forces are lower with touch weight bearing than non-weight bearing. Um, all I ask my Perthes kids to do is not run around. So yeah. I do let yeah. them walk. I They're don't give them trampolines and jumping on beds. Yeah, um, I give them usually either crutches or frame or some kind of protection and ask them not to go on long walks um, that sort of thing as well. and at school as well. They're generally not doing pee and running around in playtime. Um, can we use herring grading for any stage other than fragmentation? Well, it's for acute perthase. Remember, after that, you're losing the Stuhlberg classification. But uh, what we we're saying is it should be applied at peak fragmentation. But you only know that you've hit peak fragmentation when the next x-ray shows that you are healing up. Okay. Yeah. At what stage would you start the treatment? So Radha Krishnan, it should be before peak fragmentation. And that's why the herring classification isn't brilliant. Shares, how would you differentiate between ABN and Perthase on an x-ray? I think some of that's going to be your history, really, because Perthase is ABN, right? So if there's a history of DDH that's been treated and there is an association with uh, DDH and then a late perthase. Okay, so DDH, no signs of ABN, and then suddenly age five or six, there's signs of perthase disease, and people aren't sure if the two are related. Orf has said, how would traction or spanning X-fix help? Essentially, the idea is you're reducing those joint reaction forces, you're taking the force off that soft femoral head. Uh, Hytham has put, do you do EUA and arthrogram before considering open reduction? Uh, we're not talking about open reduction in perthase, okay? So perthase is containment. So you're either doing a femoral osteotomy to dip it in, or you're doing a shelf, or you're doing a solter, or you're doing both, but we're not opening up the hip joint itself. 
Ali, how would you treat hinged abduction? If you get hinge abduction, you've missed the boat. That's when you've got that femoral head deformity and they need a valgus osteotomy as a salvage procedure, or is what I'd say. Yeah. Uh, what joint, Andrew Hughes, what joint preservation techniques should trainees be able to talk about discussing the FRCS? None. Okay, that is all experimental stuff. Well, it's not experimental, but people are doing femoral head reduction osteotomies, okay? They're literally taking that big coxa magna, taking a wedge of the femoral head out and putting the femoral head back together. I don't know, Joe, is anyone doing that in the UK? Um, Andrea's road poshers. Is it right? He's done it a couple of times. I think Fabian's done it a couple of times as well. Wow. But um, that's certainly nothing you want to be getting into in your FRCS. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you saw how quickly time went when Anish was answering the questions. Know the basics behind it. Know the important things that you have got to say. Um, don't focus on them like weird and wonderful like that. Um, you don't need to. And I think because uh, I've got a message here from Imogen, who's kindly organising the whole thing. She's saying, get a move on. Sorry. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, last question, OK, how to differentiate Perthes from MED and SED? Um, it's to do with that difference in time. So if you're looking at things that are happening synchronously, it's more likely to be MED. Get an X-ray of the knees or a skeletal survey if you're really worried to pick up. Um, Perthes doesn't happen. You don't have it in the same stage bilaterally. Yeah. Right. So now you've seen how I approached it. You're going to show me how we should have, how I should have done it by answering the Viva questions that we're going to ask you.